Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, this is, today, the World Urban Campaign and WIGO are happy to welcome you to our, our Urban Thinker Campus, Informal Workers and COVID-19 Impacts and Vision for the Future. So today, uh, I'm just going to walk you through uh, quickly uh, uh, over our program for today. So we will have a quick welcome and introduction session, five minutes or so, followed by our Urban Thinker session. We will be joined by four panelists. Um, we will have 45 minutes for that uh, session. After that, we will have a round table session where we will try to aim to answer two questions and um, all the audience um, will be able to participate and help us answer these questions. And then we will be closing with some conclusions and recommendations. So welcome everyone. My name is Pilar Balbuena. I'm the Urban Advocacy and Communication Specialist at WIGO. And uh, for those of you that do not know who WIGO is, WIGO is the Action Research Network of Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, or WIGO. Um, it's a global network focused on securing livelihoods for the working poor, especially women in the informal economy. We believe all workers should have equal economic opportunities and rights. Today, WIGO is a thriving network of individuals and institutional members in over 40 countries. Why do we focus on the informal economy? A size alone, globally, 61% of all workers are informally employed. That is over 2 billion workers worldwide. But in developing countries, the contrast is even more striking. 90% of all workers are informally employed. Now, in this Urban Thinker campus, WIGO will provide detailed insights of the impact of the crisis on urban informal workers. But also we will focus on highlighting some creative policy and planning responses. These stem from regular updates from informal workers and their representatives, detailed in city policy and advocacy work, and global trends analysis. The COVID crisis has highlighted existing inequalities and infrastructural deficits, and yet provide a critical moment to reset cities in ways that include informal workers. A key theme that we are going to be focusing on this session is how to maximize economic opportunities while minimizing health risk. Let me now introduce you, our panelists for the Urban Thinker session. First, we are going to be hearing from uh, Mike Rogan, our Urban Policies Program Director. Mike is going to give us a presentation about the COVID-19 and the impact and responses in general. Um, Mike will be followed by Jenna Harvey, our Global Coordinator of WIGO uh, focal cities. Jenna will be um, touching on the impact of COVID-19 on informal livelihoods. After Jenna, we will be hearing from Sonia Diaz, our way speaker specialist. Uh, Sonia will be focusing on um, talking about the COVID-19 impacts and responses on the way speaker sector. And to wrap up, we will be hearing from Caroline Skinner. Caroline is our urban research director and Caroline will be focusing on informal trade during the COVID-19, the impact and responses. Um, so Mike, I'm going to stop sharing and the floor is all yours. While Mike, um, Mike, did you hear me? You are okay. going to be, you're going to be sharing your presentation. We are going to be now, we're ready for you whenever you're ready. Perfect. So Mike, we are seeing now your screen. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Pilar, for that introduction, and, and thank you very much to all the participants for joining us today. Uh, if I may, I'd, I'd just like to give some overall context, as Pilar has indicated, uh, in terms of what this current crisis means for the, for the in, informal economy. I think it's been pretty clear uh, from the beginning uh, that there was a recognition that the particular nature of this crisis would be uh, very severe for informal workers around the world. Uh, the very nature of the crisis uh, and, and the lack of protection that informal workers have always meant that it was gonna be felt more severely by, by informal workers. And the, the quotes you have on your screen now uh, from the ILO 
comes from the very beginning, comes from uh, February and March of this year, indicating that we could really expect that this crisis uh, was going to impact on, on all types of informal workers, unprotected workers in the gig economy, uh, self-employed in, in the informal sector. But let me take a step back and, and just uh, help us think about what we mean by the informal economy. Uh, the definition we use is all work and activities in which workers do not have legal or social protection through their employment. Uh, this includes both those inside and outside of the informal sector. Uh, and the informal sector is what we think of, of uh, enterprises and activities that are unregistered or, or unincorporated. Um, in the North, we often think of uh, workers in the gig economy. In the South, WeGo works with particular groups of, of informal workers, which often include uh, domestic workers, home-based workers who make products and services for uh, other companies and firms inside their homes, street vendors and market vendors uh, who sell goods, products, and services on the streets of, of cities across the global south, and waste pickers who collect recyclable materials and, and sell them on uh, in, in cities in the south. And what uh, we've come to... Mike, just a quick, uh, a quick intervention. Could we have a full screen? For oh, sure. Sorry. sorry. Is that better? Perfect. Yes, great. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, some of the work that, that WeGo's done with, with organization of, of these types of informal workers um, in the South suggests that there really has been a triple crisis faced by, by these types of workers. Uh, in the first instance, it's obviously a, a health crisis. Uh, it's clearly an economic crisis, as, as was expected from the beginning. Uh, but it's also a care crisis, meaning that workers have had to balance the, uh, the increased um, responsibilities for caregiving for children and other household members uh, with their work. And I, th I think it's also an important moment to realize that uh, when we say that the, the crisis is impacting uh, particularly severely on informal workers, we're not talking about a small group of, of workers or some sort of subset of, of the workforce. As Pilar mentioned, most workers in the world, uh, over 60%, are in fact informal. So most workers are, are, are bearing the brunt of this crisis. Uh, if you look in the, in, the, in the middle of the graph, um, if we just look at emerging and developing countries, that number goes up to 70%, meaning the vast majority of workers uh, have no protections or safety nets in, in the context of this crisis. Um, if we go all the way to the right of the graph and, and we look at uh, Africa on its own, we can see that almost all workers are informal, meaning that by definition, they lack any type of uh, protections or safety nets uh, when a crisis like this hits. So when, when we say it affects the informal economy, what we're really saying it is, is that it affects the global economy and particularly, particularly the economies of, of developing countries. It's difficult to distinguish uh, between the two. And I think that uh, the case for this um, point was, has been made uh, sort of uh, most strongly by some of the main development agencies. Um, some of the projections from the beginning of the crisis suggest that uh, poverty levels are going to go uh, back to 1990 levels. We're going to see three decades of reverse progress in terms of, of poverty reduction. Um, the World Bank's most recent estimates are that between 71 and 100 million more people um, would enter extreme poverty in 2020 as a result of this pandemic. And I, th I think the key recognition is that driving a lot of this is the increase in working poverty. And the ILO suggests that uh, up to 35 million uh, new workers could enter poverty in 2020 as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. So the impact that uh, this particular pandemic is having on informal workers who are most workers in the world are also uh, affecting most of our progress towards uh, 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 development progress that we've seen in the last uh, couple of decades. So we, we know that the informal economy is more likely to be affected than, than the formal economy as, as such, um, but it's useful to think of the ways that this might happen to help uh, uh, think about how we can support workers during this time. 
Um, some of our early scans as, as we go researchers in, in terms of the ways that the pandemic is impacting on workers, uh, we sort of group them into, into four broad areas. Um, there's certainly been an inability for workers to access markets. A lot of this is because governments have introduced strict lockdown measures to, to prevent people from uh, contracting the virus. Uh, this also has meant that work in public spaces where many informal workers uh, earn their livelihoods has, has been limited. Uh, even those who've been able to access their, their employment in public spaces, however, have seen a decreased demand. Um, this could be uh, decreases in terms of uh, uh, lack of demand for things that people are selling or making. Uh, domestic workers have not been able to uh, go to households to, to do their normal work. Uh, Home-based workers have seen dramatic decreases in, in demand for their uh, for work orders, um, uh, for the things that they make. Um, the third broad area is that we've seen an increase in the cost of inputs. Um, so for street vendors, for example, they have to pay more for the products that they sell. Uh, the cost of transport has increased in, in many contexts. And the cost of personal protection is often borne by workers in the absence of an, an employer in particular, meaning that it actually costs more for many informal workers to, to do their work safely and, and normally. And finally, the fourth area in which we've seen an impact on, on informal workers, and I mentioned this in the context of the, of the triple crisis, is the increased care burden. And this is particularly borne by women in the informal economy. Uh, as schools have closed in, in many countries across the world, women workers are, are having to balance uh, increased care work uh, with the need to put food on the table and, and, and earn some type of income. So I'll, I'll conclude my presentation with, um, with just three broad reflections on, on how to think about this as we go forward. And my colleagues will, will offer some more detail and nuance on some of these points. Um, in their presentations. Um, the first is we need to pay very careful attention to the uneven effects of the crisis within the informal economy. And probably the most important example of this is, is gender. We've seen uh, uneven effects by gender, women being disproportionately affected within the informal economy um, uh, for, for a number of different reasons, which we can discuss throughout the round table. Um, second, it's important to identify the mechanisms through which livelihoods are lost in order to inform uh, better interventions. Uh, different groups of workers uh, doing different types of work in different contexts will be affected uh, differently. And it's important to understand how each of these has a negative impact on, on livelihoods and, and earnings in order to craft our, our policy responses appropriately. Uh, and then finally, it's, it's really important to, to understand the economic and health trade-offs that many of the short-term policy responses have imposed on workers asking workers to choose between being safe and socially distancing versus earning a wage and putting food on the table is, is not a fair choice to impose on uh, particularly such a large segment of, of the global population and, and the global workforce. It's unrealistic and our policy responses have to understand uh, the need for informal workers, many who earn a daily wage, to continue earning some sort of uh, income. And I, I'll conclude with the point that uh, in these unprecedented times, there's a real need for more data on, on how the crisis is impacting different groups of workers and how different policy responses are either helping or hindering workers as they, as they try and carve out a livelihood. Um, very few studies have been conducted to date and the, and the crisis is unfolding so quickly. But WeGo has recently launched an IDRC-funded 12-city uh, study of informal workers um, in 10 countries across the, the world in order to understand exactly these types of impacts and to try and provide some real-time data to inform the types of policy responses that we'd like to see to support informal workers um, as they try and earn their livelihoods through what is certainly uh, a, at least a medium-term crisis. Uh, it shows no abating either in the, the North or the South. So it's time to think very seriously about how we can um, continue to support the vast majority of workers in the world while the crisis works through various phases in, in our countries. Um, with that, I'll say thank you, and I look forward to discussing some of these uh, topics in more detail in the roundtable, and of course, answering any questions that, that people might have um, in that part of the, uh, the seminar. So thank you very much, and over to Jenna Harvey.
Uh, thank you, Mike. While Jenna prepared to share her screen, um, we'd like to thank you, Mike, for covering the big picture about the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on key development indicators. And especially, thank you for positioning the, the informal sectors on the, within these indicators. Um, you left us with a great broad suggestion of way forwards. Uh, so now, Jenna, since I see that you're ready, um, over to you. The floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Pilar. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to provide an overview of the results of a rapid assessment that WeGo conducted during the early stages of the crisis between March 28th and the 8th of April. Um, the rapid assessment aimed to provide a snapshot into the impact of COVID-19 and related public health measures on informal workers' livelihoods. Um, it involved interviews with national and local organizations of informal workers and five regional and global networks of informal organization, workers' organizations um, across multiple occupational sectors and in three regions in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Um, and again, this is, it's a snapshot into a, a moment in time. Um, and in that moment in time, what the triple economic health and care crisis looked like for these different sectors. Um, and some broad themes coming from that were that the impact on livelihoods and income was sudden and severe, um, but mitigated in some cases by the efforts of organizations of informal workers to quickly organize to support their members and advocate for their members, even in the face of um, limited or total lack of government support in these early stages. Um, so the assessment looked primarily at two different categories of informal workers at this time. Those who were continuing to work, which included some workers who had received official essential worker designations, um, and those who had temporarily lost their livelihoods, who were not able to work. Um, so some of the specific impacts for those who continued to work, we saw that continuing to work did not mean a, a, um, sustaining income levels. So we saw reduced demand and earnings um, in part because people stockpiled before the crisis, they're using public space less. Um, in some cases that led to oversupply, to goods going bad. As Mike mentioned, increased costs of working, um, having to use private transport options, having to purchase PPE. Um, lack of protection, protection at work was a central theme. Even workers who had received essential worker designations from the government um, were making demands on government or in some cases private market administrators for personal protective equipment, for modifications to workplaces to make them more safe and secure. And largely we heard that those demands were being unmet. Um, and so organizations were organizing to provide those protections to workers to the extent that they were able. For those not working, we saw um, or we heard about an immediate economic uh, impact, loss of income, food insecurity, fear of uh, families going hungry, um, also barriers to migrants returning home and some violence directed at migrants. Um, we particularly heard this from organizations in India and Ghana. Um, shared impacts, information gaps. Uh, we heard about workers being the targets of misinformation campaigns, but also just a lack of appropriate accessible information about protection, about accessing relief measures. We heard a lot about mental health concerns um, because of the, the different types of stress caused by the crisis, an increase in gender-based violence, um, concerns about being able to access health care and social protection and um, child care was a very, very strong theme that with schools and child care centers closed, workers were having to take their children to work and were concerned um, about exposure and um, having their children with them at work. Outside of the workplace, we heard about the impossibility of physical distancing in crowded settlements. Um, rising debts was another impact for those who had taken out credit before the crisis and were then unable to repay. Stockpiling, causing shortages of hand sanitizer, soap, and masks. 
Um, and then finally, across the groups we, we talked to, we heard about police harassment. Again, even for those workers that had permission um, to be operating. So now sector-based impacts for home-based workers, those who are subcontracted, that is they receive work orders um, through a contractor, we heard about an abrupt cancellation of work orders, um, even those that were already underway. So in some cases, an immediate loss of income from that. For those who had already completed orders, we heard about the inability to collect payment um, for those orders. Um, also, home is workplace for home-based workers. So having entire families all of a sudden at home, occupying space at home, obviously presented huge difficulties in pursuing productive activities and also um, assuming an increased domestic, um, domestic responsibilities at home. So for street vendors, we'll hear more from my colleague Caroline in just a moment about specific impacts on street vendors and food vendors. Um, but the key themes here involved um, falling earnings due to people avoiding public space. We heard about stock going bad, especially for those who sell perishables, um, and also police harassment and abuse, including even the destruction of property. Um, and in some cases, clearances of markets um, that governments had wanted to pursue and seemed to be using the crisis as a pretext to be able to push forward. Um, then in the case of waste pickers, again, we'll hear more detail from my colleague Sonia in a moment. Um, but some, some themes I'll highlight now. For those who are continuing to work, we heard about just an inability to sell materials collected because of buyback centers being closed. Many of the waste pickers we work with work on dumps and landfills, um, which some of which had been closed. And again, here we see an example of the crisis being used as a pretext to push forward displacement um, that you know, we have the impression that the government had wanted to pursue even before the crisis. So where we work in Accra, for example, um, we are hearing now that the landfill that closed during the, the, the start of the crisis may not be reopened. Um, so with some of these short-term impacts, we're seeing the threat of a permanent displacement of workers from their places of work. Um, and that's certainly a concern that came through with these interviews with, with waste pickers. And then also increased occupational health risks um, without adequate protective equipment and a lack of information from governments to households about how to sort waste uh, properly to protect waste pickers, including separating medical waste. However, in the face of these negative impacts, we heard a lot about efforts of membership-based organizations of informal workers to quickly organize, to provide members with mutual aid, and to advocate with governments um, for a range of demands, including designation as essential service providers, protections, cash grants. Um, you can see here this graphic at the top is from a campaign in Lima, where informal workers across different occupation, very diverse occupational sectors joined hands to call for access to a cash grant. Um, at the start of the crisis, and to also draw in, uh, attention to their contributions as essential workers during the crisis. Um, so in addition to advocacy, we also heard a lot about support that organizations were offering members. For example, access to medical advice, um, bringing in medical professionals to provide members with information about the virus, about prevention, breaking down myths, um, providing protections. In some cases, we heard about organizations um, organizing to hand sew masks and distribute those amongst members, to acquire PPE and distribute that amongst members. Um, we also heard about vast communication networks, um, WhatsApp, it, for example, being used to communicate, check in with each other, provide mental and emotional su health support, um, and information about prevention, about natural health remedies, about where to acquire PPE. Um, related to the economic crisis, 
we heard about um, provision of legal advice. So one domestic workers organization who had provided legal advice for members opened that service up to non-members, um, recognizing the massive increase in demand for legal support as domestic workers were being arbitrarily laid off without pay. Um, so doing everything they could to support members and non-members. Um, cash assistance and food aid. We, we, you know, we heard about the limitations of resource strapped organizations to be able to provide this, but in some cases they, they could um, to provide support with funeral expenses, um, members who are having health crises. Also food aid to allow older members to stay home. Um, sometimes these, these efforts were supported by crowdfunding. And then finally, in India especially, we heard about the role of membership-based organizations in providing support to workers to register for government schemes, so navigating complex bureaucratic hurdles. Um, and then just to conclude, so the, the impacts in this, when, you know, this moment of time, the negative impacts do point to long-term troubling trends, um, which will all allude to today, you know, including fear of permanent displacement from sites of work, deepening vulnerabilities, um, particularly of women workers, older workers. Um, at the same time, especially in this first round of interviews, we heard a lot of um, visions, you know, a vision for a different kind of, of contract with governments. So for example, in this first round, this first phase of the crisis, many workers were designated essential. Um, and there was some hope that that consciousness around informal workers as essential workers who provide essential goods and services in um, food security, care, sanitation, that that shift in consciousness could eventually lead to a foundation for a more cooperative approach with governments, uh, where informal workers organizations and governments could work together um, to address long-standing inequalities, um, to work together to make workplaces more safe and secure. So you can see some of those sentiments re reflected in these quotes here. Um, the recognition of food workers as essential workers in public space as legitimate working space, um, the need to modernize workplaces to make them more safe and secure. Um, and then finally, this last quote here, um, will feel protected when the lockdown ends and authorities show their intention to include us in the public policies of the city. We hope they include us in employment policies. The reality is showing that we aren't the problem, we are the solution. So all of these quotes pointing to um, the hope that there could be a shift in, in public consciousness and in the government approach to dealing with informal workers organizations um, from more of an antagonistic to a cooperative approach. Um, and my colleagues will expand on, on these opportunities in their presentations. So I will leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you for providing a quick overview on the rapid assessment that was conducted uh, just recently uh, of the COVID-19 impact on informal workers' livelihoods. Uh, Sonia is going to be joining us while she prepares uh, uh, to share the screen. Um, just a reminder to everyone that all these presentations will be shared after the presentations. We will be sharing the recording and all the links to the information that we are providing. Um, thank you, Jenna. And now Sonia Diaz is going to be talking about the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the waste speaker sector. Sonia, the floor is yours. Sorry. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Sonia. Okay. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or even good evening, wherever you are. It's such a pleasure to be here to share uh, some of the impact and responses on waste speakers. And my focus is particularly my country, Brazil. Uh, so first, let us... Uh, Okay, so let us uh, 
talk a little bit of uh, what, who are the way speakers? Uh, the way speakers or reclaimers or catadores, uh, depending on how each country uh, uh, call them, they may collect, sort, or process household, commercial, or industrial waste on the streets or working in cooperative recycling facilities or in open dumps. And according to the ILO uh, Green Jobs Report, there are 20 million uh, workers worldwide. And these workers can work independently, uh, that is, as non organized, or they can organize themselves in cooperatives or associations or unions. They may work individually or even as a family, or most often as a family unit. And my continent, Latin America, is home of uh, some of the strongest cooperative movements, my country included, but also Colombia, Argentina, and other countries. Uh, so I'm having a bit of issue with my. Okay, sorry. Okay, so COVID-19 poses unique challenges for informal uh, waste sectors. Uh, there are greater vulnerability, pre-existing vulnerability due to insalubrious environments. They work, a lot of them, in open dumps uh, or in spaces in cooperative uh sorting uh sheds or warehouses with a lot of issues in terms of work conditions most of them lack access to safety equipment such as gloves and masks and with covid 19 as we know there is an increase of medical wastes coming from homes and this uh, added to uh, the lifespan of the virus uh, in terms of its permanence on surfaces really has serious implications for informal waste uh, pickers, adding an extra, an additional layer of vulnerability which we cannot uh, minimize. And this comes on the top of other threats that uh, these workers often uh, face. Uh, privatization, uh, the spread of technologies like waste to energy. So, uh, we go uh, from the very beginning of uh, the pandemics, uh, acted swiftly to support uh, workers. We participated in emergency relief committees in many uh, continents, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and uh, other continents. We supported uh, workers to advocate for cash grants and for food security schemes. We started tracking government policies and the impacts and responses and how workers' organizations responded to the crisis. We have a wealth of information that is, uh, we provided support to Global Rep, the Global Alliance of Waste Speakers. Our team in our organization representation program and also our urban policy uh, program and other programs are, are there at the front line supporting these workers. We provided guidelines for safety and we supported workers with communication and dissemination of messages and solidarity campaigns. Here is a poster that we uh, prepared with guidelines, safety guidelines for work areas and for the workers. And this uh, poster has been translated into more than 12 languages. And we were the first to uh, provide such guidelines, uh, teaming up with uh, epidemiologists and health experts that uh, we go Brazil team work with uh, and we were aware of the need of tracking the impacts of COVID-19 on inclusive recycling 
in my country, Brazil, which is home uh, of one of the strongest cooperative movements. So through a news tracking and a Google survey, that uh, this Google survey was carried out and 150 cooperatives across 21 states in Brazil. We tracked what were the impacts in terms of health, in terms of the use of safety protocols and other key issues like domestic violence and etc. And we uh, found out how early cooperatives uh, were in terms of not mobilizing their members to adapt to new work work conditions and I'm going to show you some findings later on and we could see their readiness the cooperatives readiness to club to join forces with some progressive municipalities and NGOs uh, to provide support to uh, these workers and we could see that the most common form of support that was provided by municipalities was food baskets and in some contexts emergency basic income and we could find out the decline uh, in value per kilo uh, of each type of recycled material was more than 20 percent which is a fi huge financial blow for the cooperatives and 40% of the cooperatives that participated in this survey stated that they were aware of cases of mental suffering due to the effects of the pandemic, especially stress and anxiety. So here you can see some of the trends in inclusive recycling, how source segregation systems in the different cities across Brazil performed in terms of maintaining or suspending uh, uh, recycling collection and how uh, these kind of actions impacted the cooperative sorting sheds and we also tracked uh, which kind of emergency measures were implemented either by governments or uh, by uh, initiatives of social movements uh, in Brazil. So you can see that the uh, readiness of cooperatives to adopt prevention protocols was quite amazing 98 percent you know were quick to introduce use of protection equipments like masks gloves and glasses and also to adopt other protocols safety protocols so as a result of that uh the, we have around we uh, surveyed around 5,000 uh, way speakers across Brazil. And you can see that uh, the, uh, we had only one confirmed case and 51 suspected. And this good performers in this first two and a half months, uh, it, this is what the survey covered, uh, I guess it's, it, it's due to the readiness of these cooperatives to adopt safety protocols. So we cannot stress uh, hard enough how important government actions are to mitigate such crises. Governments should provide the conditions that enable way speakers to practice social distance and to enable them to adopt hygiene measures that are required in, in such crises. Uh, it's very important the provision of cash grants and the provision of these grants in accessible manner and also to provide safety information uh, that is useful and in a format that way speakers can relate to and also uh, access to hand sanitizers, water stations, masks and soaps and there is a very important, uh, we cannot uh, say how important it is to test uh, the workers to keep track um, of the impacts of the pandemics on uh, these workers. And the enabling of supply and value chains, it's very important. What we saw is that uh, uh, there, there was a lot of actions in terms of providing emergency relief from uh, city governments, but most cities didn't consider uh, way speakers as essential services. And we find out that 
this is very essential, as my colleagues have already stated, you know, to provide uh, the recognition of workers as essential service providers and to provide the safety equipment that they need to perform the work in safety. So in terms of thinking forward, uh, wrapping up, I think we need to invest a lot in building informal workers' capacity to deliver in complementarity with formal systems in ways that address safety, that address decent work uh, conditions. And we need to strengthen way speakers' capacity to withstand or recover from all sorts of impacts, health impacts, economic and climate changes. And here the notion of resilience, which has been associated with climate change, is a useful notion for this current outbreak, because there is an interconnection between health, economic, and environmental crisis that we need to explore more. So we need to rethink and reshape solid waste systems to understand uh, the role informal workers before. They feed recycling markets with the raw materials that sustain production. So uh, we not only have, uh, we not only need to call on governments to act swiftly, but we need industries to also take, you know, uh, to bear its responsibility. And we need to recognize waste speakers as contributors to public health and as environmental stewards. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear Sonia, uh, for the detailed and yet quick overview of the WIGO actions to support the waste speakers uh, in the current pandemic and the overview of the impacts of the crisis uh, in inclusive recycling in Brazil. Um, again, we will be sharing all the resources that Sonia will base her presentation on. And uh, we, are join we are being joined now by Caroline. Caroline is sharing her screen, so the floor is yours, Caroline. Thank you very much. Um, so just wonderful to look around the Zoom room and see so many of WeGo's friends. So very warm welcome. Um, and I'm not, we're having slightly uh, problematic time with electricity and internet connectivity and I've got a very bad hairstyle so I'm not going to share my video. Um, so I'm concentrating on, on informal trade. Um, so we do know in terms of contribution that uh, informal trade is a dominant sector within the informal economy. Um, so drawing on, on WeGo ILO statistics, services such as trade are, are estimated to account for 71% of all informal employment in developed countries, in de uh, develop, uh, sorry, just me mentally developing countries. And there's obviously an over-representation of women. So I think um, this gendered theme has come out very strongly in all of our assessments so far. And, and particularly in, the, in food trade. Food security, so research has consistently shown that informal food vendors play a critical role in food security and a good place to look for, for content for advocacy purposes is the African Centre for Cities. In terms of impacts, um, there's in the during the lockdown, uh, non-food vendors immediately halted their activities uh, there are many countries for food vendors that impose strict limitations, so I'll list some countries there. And in some countries, informal food trade was declared an essential service, uh, South Africa, my own country, being a case in point. Um, just to say that there's really a fantastic analysis that's coming out of our law program about um, uh, COVID-19 prevention laws um, uh, that PAMI has, has done for vendors and others. So watch this space. There's some, some good content coming out. Um, there are cases of hotspots uh, where traders were not given water, PP, PPE, sanitizers, uh, markets, and as is the case with supermarkets, have become hotspots of transmission. Um, there is a direct link where um, city councils have, have, have omitted to, to provide these materials. Um, impacts in terms of livelihood, uh, only a small minority were uh, able to earn any income. 
Uh, and last savings we used in, in two to three weeks into lockdown with high dependency on food parcels. So, I mean, we're seeing it in all of our countries, um, but it's particularly acute for, the inform for informal workers is this issue of food insecurity. So the, the Food and Ag Agricultural Organization has estimated that more than a quarter of a billion people will suffer acute hunger in 2020. Uh, in the period of lockdown easing, uh, traders are trying to re-establish themselves, uh, but have little resources to do so. So responses, um, what we are really seeing quite, um, uh, we're seeing profoundly interesting um, practices emerges, emerging from the ground where street and market traders around the world are designing their own solutions to minimize health risks. Uh, if it's water stations, social distancing techniques, um, and, and so this is something uh, to, to watch. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, there are, it does imply a series of things that the traders uh, are in need of from local authorities. Um, so the biggest call is to stop doing harm. We, as Jenna said, uh, we're seeing trader evictions, we're seeing a lot of confiscation of goods um, and attempts to exclude certain traders, uh, for example, immigrants. Uh, there's a critical need for basic infrastructure to, tr to reduce transmission, so water points, sanitizers, bleach so people can make their own cleaning equipment, um, PPE and health screening at trading sites. Um, there's a critical need to be flexible in layouts uh, and the use of public spaces to help with social distancing. And bear in mind that COVID doesn't um, uh, uh, travel, it, it's far better to be outside, uh, to have retail outside. So actually this is a case where informal traders and market vendors often have an advantage over their formal counterparts. Um, but also this need to establish regular engagements with traders. So StreetNet International's rallying call of nothing for us without us. At national government, and I've seen already there's one of a, a question in the chat uh, room around, around um, income support. So as of mid-June 2020, cash transfers have been introduced in 131 countries. From WeGo's perspective, um, what's critical here is both the amounts, but also the extent to which informal workers um, are accessing the, the, the support that, that's available, and often there are implementation issues. Um, grants and or credit uh, to re-establish themselves. So much of the SMME support uh, needs to be extended to these small players. They often have registration requirements that exclude the informal economy in general and the more vulnerable within the informal economy in particular. I did want to tag just one development. Um, we, as we go through the global monitoring system, are, do uh, check what's happening globally. And we were particularly, um, we've always found content from China to be t difficult to access. And where we do see street vending trends, they tend to be very exclusive. Um, but the premier identified street hawkers as the lifeblood of the country and a key source of employment. Uh, but there has been resistance from city authorities, particularly in Beijing. So in terms of possible futures, um, I think this is my second to last slide. Um, I love this image of, of you know, us being called and, you know, in the urban space to do things differently. Uh, and this is a street in Myanmar. There's lovely examples of similar examples coming out of Indonesia uh, where um, they've claimed the streets back from, from cars and, and had a market uh, that's good for food security. So really to try and end on a positive note in, in what has been a really tricky period of, of wanting to rebuild and reset. Um, so this is the moment to address long calls for infrastructural needs. Um, in, in the case of vendors, paved surfaces, shelter water, um, and long needed incorporation into social security systems. Uh, but also to, to, to reset, to build resilience. So this is our opportunity to reimagine the cities we want. Um, and we're hoping that we can share some really constructive ideas about this in, in the, the discussion. So for more details to visit WeGo, we've got a lot of content uh, on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, that was a, thank you for highlighting the informal traders' contributions to our city's uh, economy, and in particular uh, for highlighting the lockdown impacts on this sector. And uh, love uh, the creative approaches that you 
highlighted and the suggestions and responses that they um, requested to the national and local governments. Um, uh, you left us with uh, some inspiring recommendations that I think are going to help us frame the questions that we are going to be aiming to answer during our next session, that is the round table. So for that uh, particular uh, session, I'm going to be sharing my screen again. And um, we are going to be focusing on uh, answering. Um, as you can see, uh, are you guys able to see my screen? By the silent, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we have five questions here. Um, to make sure that we spend as much time um, hearing from you guys um, and we have a, as productive a round table as possible, uh, we like to focus on the last two questions. Um, how can different groups of informal workers minimize the risk of contracting and spreading COVID-19? And then we will focus on what are the opportunities for urban transformation. So for, uh, to hear from uh, all of you, um, if you click on participants uh, and then you will see at the bottom of that little session, you will see an option to raise your hand. Uh, so you can click on that icon and then we will see your names popping up with the hand raised right next to you. And then we will start taking questions that way. Um, if you are unable to see that icon, you can place questions on the chat box and Megan, uh, Megan or Kendra and I will be unmuting or just reading the boxes uh, from the chat session. So let's start the conversation. We will have, we are allocating around 15 minutes for each question. So let's focus on the first one. How can different groups of informal workers minimize the risk of contracting and spreading COVID-19? Um, so I'm going to um, ask Megan um, if you can see uh, the participants. I see that Rubimbo has raised his hand. Um, Megan, are you able to help us mute uh, Rubimbo? Okay, hello? Hello. Hey, can everyone hear me? We hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for the presentation um, and the discussion that we've had so far. Um, my name is Ravimbo and um, I'm a Zimbabwean and I'm currently working as a research intern at the International Center for Tax and Development. Um, so my first kind of question and musing around the first question is, um, you talked about um, the impacts on gender, um, especially of this crisis and informal workers, but something that really hasn't been mentioned and I wonder if uh, Wego is doing any work on is the impacts on persons with disabilities. Um, we know that they make up a large population, especially in the global south. They say about 80% of persons with disabilities are in the global south and working informally. And then all of the challenges that come again with transition, I'm sorry, with transmission and keeping themselves safe. Um, so uh, I know it's a bit maybe of a different question, but I was wondering if Wego is doing any work on that particular group um, and also to challenge us to really think not just about gender but also about this group who are um, you know disproportionately represented in the global south and also um, probably in the informal sector as well thank you that's a very very important question um, i will pass it to our panelists um, mike jenna sonia caroline um, would you like to um, uh, try to answer the question to Rubimbo? And um, if anybody else has more questions, I see C Celine have questions. We could, now that I see actually another hand raised, we could take a couple of questions and then we just, um, just to make sure that we manage it better, then we just take two, three questions and then uh, pass it to one of the panelists. But if you have comments as well in regards of how we can uh, how, how can different groups uh, of workers, uh, informal workers, can help uh, reduce the risk of contracting and spreading the COVID-19? If you have comments, suggestions, practical recommendations, we are all here to um, just debate this question and see how we can come up with uh, some recommendations. Yeah. Uh, Celine, um, I'll give you the floor. Um, I'm going to try to unmute. So um, besides Celine, there are also a couple of questions in your chat, Pilar. Just wanted to point oh, that right. out. Sure. I will try to access that. Okay, Celine, um, we, are, we are ready to hear from you. 
So oh, thank you, Pilar. And uh, just two quick questions. One is, uh, if you're talking to local government, how do you actually make the case? And how, how do you, like, what would you tell the local government, the leadership in the local government about how you link COVID to public spaces or COVID to linking shelter and occupation? Because these are the organic links that we, the practitioners see, but sometimes it's very hard to get across to people who have to make decisions. So how would you get that across? Thank you, Celine. Um, before I pass the questions to the panelists, I'm just going to read one more question from Dania. Um, how does one make a case to urban planners and governments who want to expand sidewalks for pedestrian-friendly streets, but then evict street hackers and put them in a multi-story building? During the first month of January, which now during a pandemic is providing to be such a ha hazard for these street vendors who are relocated. How can one make an economic justification to those who fund these streets to say that you can have a shared sidewalk with vendors instead of celebrating a pedestrian friendly zone that pushes out the population that most depends on it? Uh, thank you, Dania. That is a a question that uh, we all we try to answer a lot during our work. So um, I'm going to uh, start by passing some of these questions and comments. Um, Caroline, um, because one of the last questions happy to, to what you do. I'm happy to start. Um, so uh, to Ravimbo, um, you're absolutely right. You know, I think that it's important to to look at uh, a range of different um, uh, folk who are excluded uh, and 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 disability in my own work and monitoring hasn't come up. Um, so it's a challenge to us to really uh, to engage with that. Um, it would be lovely to hear from other colleagues, uh, particularly Jenna, in terms of the rapid assessment whether you've seen much on that issue. Um, so, Celine, Dania, you're hitting the nail on the head. Oh, my goodness. Um, and, and I think we almost answer this question differently in different contexts. Um, but to just reflect on a few experiences, uh, drawing on, on my, our own uh, work, advocacy work in South Africa, uh, where I felt some of the arguments and strategies have worked, um, particularly over the COVID period, this issue of food security has been quite persuasive. Um, just there is such compelling evidence to say that informal you know, food vendors are critical for low income uh, consumers. Um, there's also issues around, which I mentioned, the fact that, that um, so some of the arguments that that COVID does isn't uh, doesn't spread as easily uh, in where there's ventilation. So obviously vendors actually are at an advantage, but where there have been particular crisis moments. So for example, um, I don't know if people are seeing this elsewhere, but um, there has been trends in South Africa to remove secondhand clothing traders on the false belief that cloth uh, will uh, is tra transmitting COVID. Um, it doesn't stick on surfaces uh, on cloth for, for long enough for that to be the case. So we've deployed evidence where we can, um, but obviously the movements of informal workers um, pressurizing local authorities in the multiple ways that they've done that is really the, the trick. Um, and so there's some very innovative you know, thinking where traders and other informal workers have have presented um, alternatives um, and that's yeah so it's, it's it's deploying the evidence and um, and and combining that with with movement pressure uh, that that seems to be the route but it would be lovely to hear from our colleagues on the panel but but also from people in the in, in the chat room uh, there's lots of expertise around the table so please let's let's hear some of your experiences in this unusual moment enough from me hello thank you caroline um, um we have uh, so did, did we get the chance to answer we have celine as well uh post a question celine did, did you uh, get the answer you expected or is something remaining there that you wanted to cover um i mean 
I can, we cannot hear you, Celine. So I'm just going to move to the next. Uh, we have another question. And um, apologies if I'm pronouncing your name uh, wrong, um, Abhishek. So we have a question from Abhishek, um, and he said, or she said, my question is related to Danias. I want to understand from participants from other countries about what has worked in negotiating with the government and policy. This is especially an issue in India, where the state government and central governments are quickly moving forward suspensions or labor protection measures and laws in a bid to attract more capital investment and accelerate recovery. This is, of course, myopic and highly problematic, but the real issue is, a, is to negotiate with a government and bureaucratic machinery that is so unwilling and ill-informed despite years of research on informality and social protection. Um, so, who will like to try to answer this question? Um, I see, I'm just going to scan quickly the, the chat box um, to see if I see any other question. And uh, Megan, Kendra, please feel to jump in to see if I'm missing any uh, hand raised icon um, of any other participant. And so I have another question to add to that, and it's one by Ana Gomez. Um, I have two questions to Sonia Diaz. First, what actions can cooperatives take to pressure municipalities that do not recognize waste pickers? Voice in the making of a formal residues collecting system. Second, I am a professor in Fortaleza, Brazil. The post-COVID situation of a street and organized waste pickers is very bad. What policy solutions do you suggest to minimize the vulnerability of these workers? So Sonia, um, since this question is particular, um, post to you, I'm going to give you the floor and see if we can as well try to answer the question of um, from India. Uh, otherwise we pass it to another panelist. Sonia? Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think uh, oh, oh, one of the key things at least for me and from the kind of work that I have been doing all my life, which is to build collabor collaboratively um, platforms. Uh, the experience that I have, particularly in my city, Belo Horizonte, is around uh, providing spaces for different uh, partners, uh, Partners from government, partners from cooperative, from the cooperative movement, and partners from NGOs, the civil society, to come together and collaboratively design policies. So, in the context of COVID-19, what we quickly did here was to create uh special COVID-19 uh, working group uh, in our alliance called the Waste and Citizenship uh, Forum, uh, which is a multi-stakeholder kind of consultative uh, space in which city officers and civil society are both represented and hold regular meetings around solid waste uh, management particularly recycling, inclusive recycling. So at the COVID-19 working uh, committees, we started uh, analyzing what were identifying, what were the impacts of COVID-19 on the cooperatives in our city, and also what kind of uh, social protection policies we need to put in place to support them, especially in the initial uh, uh, phase of COVID-19. And another working group that we designed, we created was around uh, designing together with the way speakers and the city officers, what were the safety measures that we need to put in place in the cooperatives. So this is to say that for me, where we have um, 
participatory governance. We need to get people together, all the alliance, and start, you know, working together. And where there is none, I think it's a moment in which uh, organizations who have a kind of voice start advocating to create uh, uh, for the creation of committees or working groups. Uh, for instance, I know that in some contexts in Brazil, ABIS, which you might be familiar with, the Professional Association of Sanitation Engineers, uh, is is ready to support people at local level to convene uh, meetings and working groups with city officers. So. I guess my answer is around uh, get together and use your voice if you are in a condition, you know, being someone who is uh, uh, belong to a university or any respected association or organization to start getting uh, different allies together. It, thank you, Sonia. Um, I like to as well, to, uh, thank you for that comprehensive answer, Sonia. Um, we have a comment that uh, Pat Horn like to uh, make. So Pat, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Pilar. Um, I want to start with answering the question about negotiating with government. Um, and from there, I'll also answer some of the other questions. Because um, the person who asked that question, I think that they're quite right. Uh, the, the issue of what's happened with the possibility to negotiate things with government during this COVID time um, is, is a key issue. Because COVID, of course, has been quite sort of political in a way. And the way in which different governments respond has been different. So you mentioned particularly the, the example of India. And um, somebody talked about the fact that the Indian government has been uh, taking a, a sort of very un, uh, unfriendly uh, uh, strategies in an attempt to attract investment. But um, in South Africa, where I'm based, um, uh, we, we've been uh, using the tripartite plus negotiating forum that we have here, which consists of um, government, labor, business, and the community constituency. So we've used the space of the community constituency and we work jointly with labor. But uh, what we've noticed is that the, 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 um, the problems of, of COVID have created certain uh, advantages because for what WeGo has been working on for some time now is we focus on organizing workers in the informal economy into membership-based organizations. And we've been pushing for some time for those membership-based organizations to have a seat at the table of negotiations, both at negotiations at local government level with municipalities. And this one of tripartite negotiations has been harder to penetrate. But interestingly, in South Africa, where we have a more, uh, I would say, progressive government than you have in India. So we have a different response from our government. But uh, we found out that the, the COVID crisis has caused some of the silos between government departments to break down. Uh, the uh, NEDLAC structure, uh, once COVID hit, set up a rapid response task team, which means meets every week for rapid responses which have to be faster than the way things normally happen when there's lots of long delays. This has created a space that we've been able to use. Um, so for example, um, we have been able to, somebody asked a question about public space. That's a very key issue. But the problem is that public space is something that is managed at municipal level. And um, uh, oh, they've asked me to start my video. Okay, um, to have, um, at municipal level, public space is normally managed, but it, it, nobody has got the resources or the capacity to be able to go and negotiate with every single municipality in the country. So the key has been to get national government to look at this, and normally public space is not determined at national government level. But what we have managed to do through this National Economic Development and Labor Council is to convince them that uh, 
now that we have some relaxation of uh, lockdown uh, measures and for, so that people can get back to work but we still have uh, we still have increasing infections so therefore it's extremely important to manage what happens in public space so we've been able to convince now this national structure to set up a special national task team with the um, government departments of uh, local government as well as the south african labor um, local government association to have a task team especially to look at uh, public management of public space and there we have the workers of, of uh, the representative informal workers we also have representatives of labor who are supporting us um, on, on this issue so it's it's been very key to try to get a space at the negotiating table and there have been some uh, unusual things happening like this breaking down of some of the silos between government so in the national task teams we find government departments working together who it used to be very hard to get to work together before um, one of the things that is happening because one of the public space issues is in the transport sector and um, it's it's a hot potato at the moment in south africa um, and what's happened as a result of dealing with this issue, I, I've just this morning come from a meeting of NEDLAC where we met with the Minister of Transport. And the Minister of Transport also has agreed for the first time ever, um, instead of just looking at negotiating with the minibus taxi industry and the, uh, the associations who, who are basically the employer sector, they basically agreed to look at the working conditions of the taxi drivers, the minibus taxi drivers. and um, He's, he's, he's now been persuaded uh, to speed up the formalization of the taxi industry in, the, in line with recommendation 204 of the ILO, which is about transitions from the informal to the formal, which means a formalization process, which is not a unilateral imposed uh, process whereby uh, people in the in an informal industry are trying to uh, meet requirements that are impossible to meet and one of the and and, and it's it's an it's a formalization which is looking at the situation of the workers how to get them onto social protection how to get them into negotiations and of course using the advantage that we have at the moment we managed to get a representative of the informal taxi drivers into the, um, the national meetings, which we would never have managed to do before. So I think the issue of trying to see what negotiating space there is, is important because the COVID crisis has made governments look at some of the people-centered issues that were not so high on their agendas before. The issue of social protection, we got taken by surprise yesterday in South Africa when the unthinkable happened and the Minister of Social Development announced that her department is now considering a basic income grant, which um, so far we managed to get a temporary one. We got our foot in the door, but we never thought that we were this close to looking at, um, at a national universal grant, which now, um, you know, the process of, of negotiating how that's going to happen and what it's going to look like is going to start as a result of that. Um, with relation to uh, people with disabilities, again, uh, if uh, in, in South Africa, this community constituency that I'm part of consists of many sectors of the community, and one of them is the sector of people with disabilities. So, they, so the representatives of people with disabilities are sitting side by side with us in these negotiations. And for them also, the key issue is to get a place at the table. So it's extremely key to get a place at the table uh, and then supported by the kind of uh, technical um, expertise that we get from WeGo. That is very key to us winning some of our demands. So we're starting to win certain things that a year ago I would have told you were completely impossible. But then it means training up the membership based organizations of workers in the informal economy, how to negotiate at municipal level, because that's where it starts, but then to start getting a seat at the national table. And I can mention four countries wow. where this is actually I'm happening. Sorry. I'm sorry, but um, I, I, I have to interrupt you. Like we could sit here and uh, the, the information you are giving us is so important. Um, we do have one more question that we would like to try to answer. Um, so I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, uh, I just, we just have to 
try to, to move, uh, move on a bit. Uh, and we have one more question about taxation. So um, thank you, Pat. Uh, we really appreciate your intervention and your comments. And thank you for trying to help us answer that question. So it's one more question about taxation. Um, Kendra, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see it, but it, it, it was a question directed to Mike Rogan. Um, if you can point me to that, that would be great. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to, we only have a few more minutes left for the last question that we have uh, before we do conclusions. Um, we could come back to the tax question as soon as I'm able to see it again. So the- I found it, Pilar, if you'd, if you'd like me to ask it. That would be great. Thank you, Kendra. Sure. So this is a question from Louise. Um, it says, uh, government interventions in supporting the informal economy could see the possible taxation of the economy, which many informal workers are trying to avoid in Namibia, specifically where I am from. As a country, it is my opinion that we should not tax the informal economy just yet, as we have not created a conducive operating environment that encourages sufficient profit to afford tax. Where should we then place our priorities at this time? And I'm wondering if um, maybe Mike might have some thoughts um, on that. Thank you, Kendra. Mike, could you help us? Yeah, thank, you. thank you for the question. Can you hear me, Pilar? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thanks. Yeah, we, we've been talking about uh, the issue of tax a little bit in WeGo. In fact, in, in March, we published a working paper on taxation in the informal economy. This was, of course, just before COVID became the main issue in all of our lives. Uh, but we found, I think, two things that are relevant. Um, part, part of the paper included a small survey of market traders in, in Ghana, um, as well as a large national survey of, of households in Ghana. And the first thing that we found that we describe in a paper, and we'll put a link to the paper in the chat, chat room as soon as I'm done answering the question, uh, is that in countries where uh, the informal economy is taxed, taxation is usually regressive, uh, which means that uh, low paid workers in the informal economy tend to pay a higher tax rate than wealthier people. Um, so the more vulnerable workers end up paying a larger share of their income towards local taxation. And it's usually taxation in the form of uh, fees, rentals, permits, uh, special taxes to, to local governments. So that's the first thing we found. The second is across the literature uh, in terms of studies which have looked at taxation in the informal economy, one of the main issues that comes out of, out of all of these studies is that informal workers often feel that they don't get what they pay for. Um, in, in other words, they don't get anything returned for their, for their taxes. And one of the things that comes up most frequently is access to running water, uh, sanitation, other hygiene services, uh, adequate shelter, uh, particularly in, in markets, market areas and, and street stalls. And if you, if you think about it, those issues are now the most crucial when it comes to operating safely and working safely in the era of COVID. So there's, I think, a direct link between uh, the existing work on taxation, um, which, which WeGo has reviewed, uh, and what workers have been asking for uh, for some time uh, in terms of what they expect for the taxes that they do pay to their local governments. And, and one of the recommendations that we'd come up with, again, this is, this is in the pre-COVID world, was that uh, informal workers generally tend to be in favor of paying taxes themselves as long as it's fair and they get something uh, back from it. Uh, and one of the recommendations we've come out we've come up with, uh, based on on some of the earlier studies as well, is that when designing taxation systems, it's important to work with the organizations of informal workers. There are a couple of studies, one from Uganda, which suggests that when you work with organizations of workers, uh, you're more likely to get uh, workers to pay tax when they have a negotiation and they have a voice and they have agency in the process of designing these. And I think that's something that, uh, that has really been highlighted during this, this COVID crisis. I'm not sure if other people on this, on this call have this image that I have in my head. It was a photo of a, 
uh, of a market area in Ghana, I think it was, uh, where the workers and the organizations themselves had demarcated very careful spaces for trading and had large gaps between their stalls uh, to promote social distancing. And each stall had its own set of uh, sort of sanitizer and other types of uh, personal protection, gloves, masks, and things like that, so that customers could feel safe. And I think if we were to link that with the issue of local taxation, I think we'd be probably getting some traction both in the tax debate and in uh, the bigger question of, of how to make it safer for workers around the world to carry on with their livelihoods. Of course, there's a broader issue of, of taxation, uh, which is how developing countries in particular uh, are able to raise taxes more effectively, particularly from uh, large multinational corporations that typically shirk their taxation responsibilities and reinvest that money um, back into, uh, for example, health programs in, in developing countries. So uh, in WeGo, and I'll post the link in the, in the chat now, we've been looking more at local taxation, which is the first thing I spoke about. But of course, there's a large conversation and a, and a different literature about uh, taxation at the, at the broader level. Uh, thank, thank you, Mike. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mike. So we have five minutes to go over the next question. So I'm just going to um, make this screen again bigger. Um, okay, so we were trying to answer. Um, so let me just go back again to bigger screen. Um, so five minutes to go over what are the opportunities for urban transformation. So if you have comments, if you have any questions uh, regarding this, and then after that we have five minutes for the quick conclusions and recommendations. So if you have uh, a pressing comment question, this is uh, your time, or oh, a question for one of the panelists. Uh, anything uh, that uh, any of, I, I don't see the chat box uh, session here. Let me see. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Um, all right. So if um, any of you, uh, Sonia, uh, Mike, Jenna, uh, Jenna, we have no hair from you. If you want to mention uh, something, and I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot, about what are the opportunities for urban transformation, or we could just leave that as a, as something that we can think of, and we can just move to our conclusions and recommendations. But Jenna, is there anything um, that you would like to comment uh, before we move to the conclusions and recommendations? Um, yeah, so I know the conclusions and recommendations will address this last question. So I just wanted to take advantage to quickly let everyone know, I've seen a few comments on the chat box about um, more information and sharing information with governments. Um, if anyone is interested in learning more about the rapid assessment results um, and accessing a, a compendium of resources and materials from WeGo's response, um, to COVID-19. Today we're launching an ebook in English, which will be available on the WeGo website um, today and available in French and Spanish in the next two weeks. Um, so just to let everybody know to look out for that and much of the content we've been presenting today um, is available in that ebook. Thank you, Jenna. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And if so, I may. Yes, please, Sonia. Yeah, well, you know, as a garbologist that I am, I'll speak about, very focused on uh, we speakers. I think it's, it's very important that we try to transform this strategy, you know, that this pandemic represents into an opportunity for developing uh, safety guides and, in, and reinforcing the need for uh, the decent work agenda into uh, the waste sector work. Uh, we we know that the conditions of waste pickers, you know, has so I mean they always faced a lot of risks. So this is not new, but um, I think uh, 
the hygiene and safety issues uh, not being a new demand, it, it's more dramatic now in the context of uh, COVID-19. Uh, and we should take this opportunity to, to transform the work processes and, and the cooperative sorting centers uh, in, in dumps where most of uh, uh, workers, waste speakers work in. And we should also adopt uh, a kind of view in terms of safety that goes beyond uh, putting the blame on the worker in terms of only addressing issues regarding personal equipment, safety equipment. We need to think about collective equipment. We need to think about the adequate infrastructure. Unless we think holistically, we will not change the conditions that these workers uh, face. Yeah, and this is an opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, so with this, we move into wrapping up uh, our Urban Thinker Campus session. And um, so I'm going to take for our conclusions and recommendation, the closing comments and remarks from uh, Caroline's presentation, where uh, she mentioned part of our uh, four art approach. So when we talk about the four art approach, we're talking about the relief, the recovery, the rebuild and reset to more inclusive, just and equitable cities. So we, when we talk about relief, what we want to highlight is that do no harm approach and direct income support for informal workers. When we talk about recover, um, we are talking about informal operators that need income assistance to restart. Um, grants and credits for inputs that must be extended down to these small players, not just the formal workers or formal businesses only. Um, when we talk about rebuild, we are trying to highlight that we need to address loan call for infrastructural needs. Um, informal workers are in need of housing, water, and sanitation, but also workers groups um, are in need of a specific infrastructure. Uh, we have to think about what are the needs of streets and markers traders and waste pickers. They are particular sectors with particular needs. And we need to think about long needed incorporation into social security systems. And when we talk about reset to a more inclusive, um, inclusive and just and equitable cities, what we are saying uh, is that this is an opportunity to, re to reimagine the cities we want. And in that last two points, the reveal and reset, um, rebuilding and resetting globally, we like to propose a 10-step agenda for inclusive cities. Um, this step agenda, we break it down in these 10 components. So the first one is building from what already exists. Informal workers are providing to all of us, producing, distributing essential goods and services. They need to be paid for those essential goods and service, uh, goods and services that are provided to us. The third step is protections for essential workers. And when we talk about protection, is they need access to occupational health and safety. They need adequate infrastructure and basic services. They need training. They need capacity building to understand how to protect themselves. Um, as well, we're talking about as locally suitable technologies. Technologies that are pro poor moderniz modernization of city systems for food supply, for waste management, that include transportation for them, that take in consideration the need of energy, instead of only focusing on capital intensive technologies. We need to focus on the need of social protection. Informal workers need access to health. They need emergency cash grants. They need access to child care. They need access to pensions. We need as well all inclusive policies that are covering non-nationals, organized and non-organized informal workers. The seventh step is a gender lens, gender sensitive approach. We need to consider interventions to alleviate women additional burdens and responsibilities. We need as well to think about campaigns, non-stigmatization of informal workers campaigns. 
Unfortunately, in times of pandemic, we already have seen it. There is a great risk of blaming workers and their workplaces as vectors of disease. The ninth step is to think about sustainable, sustainable livelihoods. We need to plan for the livelihoods and include the livelihoods of informal workers on our plans. We need to monitor and evaluate the impacts that they are receiving on crises like this. And the last point is what we hear always from them. Nothing for us without us. It's a participatory urban govern governance approach through multi-stakeholders platforms. So with this 10-step agenda, we leave you and we thank you very much for joining us in this joint effort with the World Bank campaign and WIGO. And we certainly hope to see you very soon. Um, we, um, we ask you to take a look at the resources of the World Bank campaign. That was very kind to collaborate with us on this presentation. And uh, let's take actions together uh, to fight this crisis. Thank you once again. Thank you to our panelists. And thank you to all of you for joining us. And with this, we wrap up our session.